Good evening, my fellow true crime enthusiasts. Come on in, gather around. There's plenty room for everybody. And yeah, this is our first story of a weekend double bill. So like I said last night when we were talking about Charles Albright, we're going to do a double bill of horrific tales that went on to inspire some pretty creepy horror movies that you might have seen in recent years. And our first story takes place in 1981, which was a very horror kind of themed year. We got The Evil Dead, we got American Werewolf in London, The Howling, My Bloody Valentine, the list goes on and on and on. And on a happier note, it was a great year for music. Kim Carnes had Betty Davis eyes, Phil Collins could feel it in the air tonight and Journey was belting out Don't Stop Believing," which is still one of the catchiest tunes of all time and I'll fight anyone over that. But let's not dilly-dally because like I said, we've got a lot to cover this Saturday evening. So before we get into it, welcome to The Criminal Spud where we explore some true crime in a short and informal way. Some of the content that we cover might be disturbing or distressing at times. So look, if this is not your jam or if you're not in the headspace today, that is a-okay. Go ahead and press skip. If however, you do want to see more content like this, let me know by liking and subscribing. And without further ado, let's talk about our first story of our double bill, which is the case of the Sharp family. Now, this is also known as the Keddy Cabin murders, the Cabin 28 murders. There's many, many different names given to this crime. It is very infamous. It is very widely reported on. And to this day, it is technically unsolved. And I say technically unsolved because nobody was ever charged with any of the murders that we're going to talk about but I just for the life of me can't understand why because not only was there physical evidence circumstantial evidence and multiple confessions yeah they just they never really quite got around to charging anybody so there's a lot of fuckery that's involved and we're just going to keep it to the highlights because this is one of those cases where you could spend days going down a rabbit hole and I have once or twice gotten sucked in and I've gone you know into deep dives and conspiracy theory forums and it will drain the life out of you. So on the off chance that you're someone who's never heard of this case up until this video then by all means if you do want to go ahead and look it up and find out a bit more I implore you to do so. There's no lack of resources online about this case but just be prepared to come away feeling slightly tormented because the more you read about it the more you learn about it the more frustrated you will become that nobody has actually been brought to justice for these murders. And I know that we mentioned both of the stories we're going to talk about tonight have gone on to inspire some horror movies of their own. So this case was apparently the story that inspired The Strangers, that movie from 2008 that absolutely terrified me. Now, I am a horror movie fanatic. I can't get enough. Not many movies do scare me. But I was 18 when I saw The Strangers and I went to the cinema to see it with my boyfriend at the time and then we went home to this big dark empty house and I remember feeling very unsettled. I was waiting for the door to knock if I'm honest and even now on a rewatch it does get my heart rate going. However if you've seen The Strangers it is worth calling out that the events in the movie focuses on this couple that are out in the middle of nowhere and they're kind of stalked and harassed throughout the night. That is not what happens in the Sharp family murders or the Keddie Cabin murders, whatever you want to call it. It it may have very well inspired the movie The Strangers, but it is by no means based on the actual events that we're going to talk about. So let's just get started. So the Sharp family, who were these guys? The Sharp family was made up of Sue, who was the mother, and her five children. So Sheila, Rick, Greg, Johnny and Tina. And Sue... And the kids had basically relocated from Connecticut over to California. Sue had gone through a divorce. She was in a really kind of abusive relationship. There was a lot of domestic violence there. And she had decided, look, we're going to maybe just get a fresh start, move across country. I believe her brother was in California. So she wanted to move closer to family on her side. And they came to live in Keddie, which is this idyllic area very small out in the woods all these little cabins and there's not much around I even looked it up online just to get a bit of information on Keddie and as of 2022 the population of Keddie is listed as 67 yeah 67 people not not big so I imagine it's really just a tiny little corner of a wider area in Plumas County 
and the Sharps, they move into cabin number 28 in November of 1980 and they've got neighbours. So there's lot, there's like a little row of cabins. It's a whole little neighbourhood of cabins out in the woods. So it's not like they're out in the middle of nowhere without anybody around. There's other kids in the area. So, you know, their kids settle in, they go to school there. They have friends that live a couple of doors away. It's a lovely, like I said, it almost sounds like an idyllic place to live if you've never seen a horror movie in your life. But once you've seen that first horror movie, cabins in the woods just become a no-no. And although the kids are settling in, they're making friends, they're enrolled in school, the neighbourhood, a lot of the different people in the area, they don't take too kindly to this divorcee who's on welfare with five kids, you know, the single mother. They don't seem to take too kindly to her moving into their nice little corner of town. And some people got on quite well with Sue. Some people had no issue with her and were more than happy for their kids to mix. But there were definitely neighbours, you know, around that area where Sue had moved into who just kind of looked at her like dirt, who didn't want their children being exposed to that kind of a home life. And there were all these really ugly rumours swirling and being circulated about Sue. Everything from, you know, she was into drugs and she had drug deals going on in her house and drug parties and she had all these gentlemen callers. We couldn't even keep track. And it's just the most nasty ugly stereotypical gossipy slanderous shit that you can imagine being flung at someone who's just moved into a new area and doesn't meet you know the standards that certain neighbors seem to think that their neighborhood should have and then there was other people who kind of said she was a lovely woman she didn't even drink they kept to themselves so there was a very interesting contrast there shall we say and the sharp family were not in the keddy area for long because only a couple of months after moving there Sue would be dead, her son Johnny would be dead, her daughter Tina would be missing and a family friend Dana would also be dead. So the events take place in April of 1981 and Sheila who was Sue's 14 year old daughter she's been at a sleepover so she went and stayed with a neighbour a couple of doors down And the next morning, April 12th, she gets up and she's ready to go home. It's about half nine in the morning. And she walks a couple of cabins down to her house and she walks through the door and straight away she is met by the most horrific of scenes. The entire living room right as she walks through the front door is a massacre. There's blood everywhere. There are three bodies who are deceased. They are bludgeoned beyond recognition. She doesn't immediately know who these bodies are belonging to. There's blood on the walls. There's blood on the ceilings. There are knife holes in the walls. It is like something out of a Saw movie. And she screams and she turns and she runs back up the road to the neighbor's house that she stayed at the night before. And she goes in and she tells the mother, there's three bodies in my sitting room. I don't know who they are. We need to call the police. So this neighbor calls the police And then they go back to the house and she's trying to get around the side window because there's there's three bodies very clearly laid out in the sitting room area, you know, as you walk through the front door. But where the hell is everybody else? There's a lot more than that that should be in this house. So where are they? So they go around the back of the house and they look through one of the bedroom windows and they can see that Rick and Greg, the two youngest boys, are still asleep in their bedroom and they have an overnight guest as well so the next door neighbor's kid um Justin he's stayed over and all three boys are still asleep in the back bedroom so Sheila opens up the window and she's telling them you need to come through the window you know you don't go out the door come this way so she removes the boys one by one so that they do not have to go out and see the horror scene that she had to see when she walked through the door But they seem to still be missing one child, Tina, the youngest girl. She's missing. She's nowhere to be found. They have no idea where the hell Tina is because she's not asleep in any of the bedrooms. But she's also not one of the bodies that is laid out in the living room. We come to find that the three bodies laid out in the living room belong to Sue, the mother, the son, Johnny, and Johnny's friend, Dana, who had been in the house, obviously, the night before. And their bodies have been 
brutalised, like I said, beyond recognition. Sue was found naked from the waist down. She had been gagged. She had her face battered, bruised, cut. Her skull had been fractured. She suffered serious head trauma. Her teeth had been smashed in. Her hands were down to bloody stubs from the defensive wounds that she had inflicted on herself from trying to fight back. And she had suffered numerous stab wounds into her chest and also into her throat. One of the the stab wounds in her throat had gone through so far that it had nicked her spinal cord. So just, yeah, I can't even, I get a pain in my throat even thinking about it. And her teenage son, Johnny, he was also beaten very savagely. He had suffered stab wounds to the throat and some pretty serious skull fractures, which most likely were his cause of death, much like Sue. It was blunt force trauma. There was no two ways about it. And his hands and his feet had been bound by like this wire and this electrical tape. So it kind of indicated that this wasn't just a blitz attack, although it was vicious, it was brutal. It looked like it went on for a prolonged period of time. It was quite torturous. And then his friend Dana, also a teenager, he was a local boy. He was found, it looked like as though they had tried to bind him the same way that they had bound Johnny. There was tape and there was wire on him, but it was only on one side. He he hadn't been successfully bound, you know, hands together, feet together. But he did also suffer some blunt force trauma to the face and to the head. However, his cause of death seemed to be strangulation. And they found multiple bloody knives at the scene. They found a hammer at the scene. There was knife marks in the walls, which is so chilling. Like you don't even want to imagine what the hell happened, that there were knife marks in the walls and blood everywhere like I said from floor to ceiling there was just blood everywhere it was a complete bloodbath but no sign whatsoever of Tina and you know could it have been the case where Tina stumbled upon this and she ran you know she got up out of bed and she came out when she heard a noise and then she made off into the night and they went after her but her coat and her shoes had been taken and she also had this little shoe box that she used to covet and bring around with her everywhere and that was also missing so they never recovered that so it does kind of point more towards an abduction of Tina there was no real evidence to suggest that she had lost her life in this house like the others but the three boys that were in the house in the cabin so the the youngest boys Rick and Greg and their neighbor Justin they had all apparently slept through this. They were undisturbed in their beds or at least at this point they were terrified and traumatised enough to just say that they were all asleep in their beds and they did not see or hear anything. So where the hell do the authorities even start on this one? And immediately the neighbourhood was on fire with gossip. There was all this ugly shit swirling around that this was some kind of a drug party gone wrong or this was probably one of her gentleman callers or you know it was very much victim blaming very much directed at Sue as though Sue had brought some kind of trouble to her own door. One of the neighbours which was actually one of the neighbours that Sheila had stayed with the night before all this happened she goes on camera she's on one of these documentaries and she's in her own words, speaking from her own mouth, like a real see you next Tuesday. And she's saying how, you know, I just think she could have been a better mother. And she doesn't qualify it. She just, like she gives no further insight as to why she thinks that. But it's just, and she's smiling. This is after they've found these three bodies absolutely bludgeoned beyond recognition. And a young child has gone missing and she's, you know, recounting these events for some documentary and she's smiling. She's standing there recounting it and still saying these really ugly things about Sue, all the while claiming to feel so sorry for these poor kids. It's so tragic that these kids lost their lives and, you know, how lovely these kids were. But I'm sorry, you're not showing an ounce of of compassion, an ounce of, you know, empathy. It just, it was so dehumanizing. And she wasn't the only See You Next Tuesday because there was another guy that was interviewed for one of these documentaries that I watched. And he alleged, and I say alleged because he wouldn't show his face. He would go on the record and, you know, give a statement as to his 
experience with the Sharp family, you know, as a neighbour in the short time that they lived there. Like they were there for five months, might I remind you. But he was basically saying that, oh, yeah, well, she had this gentleman collar. Pretty sure he was a Greek, you know, he had darker skin. And they would get into these really raucous fights and, you know, they'd be motherfucker this, motherfucker that. And it would be really loud and it was all dramatics. And he says that, you know, well, sometimes cocaine does that. And I'm kind of like, he's just shoveling on all of this horrible, baseless, you know, these horrible, baseless accusations. And we're talking about a woman who was violently, viciously brutalized in her own home in front of two kids. And there is zero compassion being shown for this woman. And the thing that gets me is that even if she had a different gentleman caller every night, even if she did take drugs, even if she was a bad mother, that in no way excuses what happened to her and these two boys and the fact that Tina has now been abducted. Like, what planet are these people on? And just to, you know, settle the record... The toxicology reports came back and there was zero alcohol and zero drugs in Sue Sharp's system. So put that in your pipe and smoke it, neighbours. So the police start trying to create a suspect list. They start compiling names. They start talking to neighbours to see if anybody saw anything, if anybody heard anything. And the main guy that comes into focus is the next door neighbour. His name is Martin Smart and his buddy, Bo. And it's really not looking too good for these guys because Martin Smart is allegedly a very abusive husband to his wife, Marilyn. And Justin, the the next door neighbor kid that was staying over in the Sharp household, Justin is Martin Smart's stepson. So he was interestingly in a bedroom asleep with the two younger boys and that bedroom was not interfered with. Nobody in that room was harmed. And they apparently slept through it, which we'll come to now in a moment. But Marilyn, who is Martin Smart's wife, she gives a lot of really crucial information to the police. So her account of that night was that her husband, Martin, had basically been pestering her, you know, will you tell Sue to come out to the bar? Him and Bo were going to a bar and he wanted to find a partner for Bo. So he was kind of saying to Marilyn, you're friends with Sue. Can you not try and convince her to come out? And Marilyn was like, well, Sue doesn't even drink and she's home. There's kids staying over. Justin is staying over. Like, I don't think that she's going to be interested in going out. And apparently Martin was really annoyed at this and he kind of just said, "Ugh, whatever. And he went out and drank into the wee hours at this bar with his friend Bo. And Sue, of course, she did not go out and she did not meet up with these guys. So that was the first thing that Marilyn said. Marilyn then recalls waking up really, really late at night, early into the morning at about 2 a.m. Maybe it was 3, between 2 and 3 a.m., And she said she could hear something outside. So she went over to the bedroom window and she looked out and she saw her husband Martin and his friend Bo burning something in this like wood fire burner that they had. So she said that was kind of the second thing that was really sus and raised massive alarm bells with her. And then the police actually come and arrest Martin and Bo and they bring them in for questioning and they search the the house of basically Martin and Marilyn and underneath the house they find a bloody jacket that belongs to Tina. So Tina is the child that is still missing. She's been abducted. She has vanished without a trace but they now find a jacket belonging to Tina underneath the smart household and Marilyn recalls this. So Marilyn talks about this bloody jacket that belonged to Tina being found. But interestingly, the guy who was the sheriff at the time, he now says he doesn't really recall that. He doesn't recall there being a a bloody jacket belonging to Tina found. So yeah, Marilyn's just making this up, allegedly. Like Marilyn's just pulled this out of the clear blue sky. Not that she would have a reason to make this up, but okay, let, let's continue. So Martin and Bo are released. They can't hold them. They don't, in their opinion, have anything compelling enough to bring forward charges. So they let them walk. And Martin drives, about two weeks after the murder, Martin drives down to Reno to stay with some friends. And he acts very strangely when he's staying with these friends. And apparently he gets really bent out of shape one night. He's been 
you know, allegedly taking some substances and he's kind of spinning out and the friend recalls him pacing around the house and wanting to leave, you know, you you need to drive me back there now. I have some stuff I need to, to finish off, you know, I, I've forgotten to do some things. And this friend kind of recalls, you know, he was just so loopy. I was trying to explain to him, we'll go tomorrow. It's the middle of the night. You, you don't need to go back there. There's crazy stuff happening there. There's a murderer on the loose there. Why on earth do you want to go back? But according to this friend, Martin was just, he was not listening to it. He was tunnel visioned and he just kept repeating, you know, I have stuff that I need to finish. I need to get back there. And by this point, Martin Smart's wife, Marilyn, who's given all this information that is kind of, you know, massive red flaggy, she's left him. She she doesn't want anything to do with him. She's basically broken it off with him the day that these murders were discovered. So Marilyn, I think it's pretty safe to say, Marilyn's pretty convinced that he has something to do with this. And while Martin Smart is up in Reno with these friends, he writes a letter to Marilyn, which she also shares with the police. And listen, I consider this a confession, but that is just my opinion based on my reading of it. I'm going to read you the exact line and you can tell me what you make of this. So he writes her a letter and in it, it says, I've paid the price of your love. And now that I've brought it with four people's lives, you tell me we are through. Great. What else do you want? So yeah, um, I don't know how many ways there are to take that. And although Marilyn does, you know, bring this letter to the police, that sheriff that I mentioned earlier that doesn't recall Tina's bloody jacket being found at Martin's house, he never enters this letter into evidence for whatever reason. Maybe he forgot. But that's not the only, you know, thing that could be construed as a confession that somehow didn't quite make it into evidence. Apparently, Martin Smart, he's a veteran, And he used to see a counsellor through the Veterans Administration, so the VA. And he had basically told this counsellor at one point that he was involved in this killing and that he didn't admit to killing all of them, but he admitted that he killed a woman and her daughter. But when this was brought to the attention of the authorities, they just dismissed it as hearsay. Deep breaths. And Marilyn makes a few other claims. So Martin's estranged wife at this point, Marilyn, she also claims that her son, Justin, who had stayed over at the Sharp house the night this had all happened, that the police had taken his shoes as evidence because there was blood on the soles, which didn't really make sense because had he been asleep the whole time and he went out the window, if you remember the next morning, he would have never passed through that really horrible, grisly, bloody scene. So why would there have been blood on his shoes? And Marilyn kind of says, you know, we never heard anything about it again. We never got those shoes back. But again, this is just something that Marilyn has allegedly made up, pulled out of thin air because what shoes? We didn't take any shoes. Like you can't make this stuff up. And the sheriff who was kind of in charge at the time where this horrible incident took place, he retired about three months after this all went down. And he basically went off. He didn't retire. He went and he took another job with the Department of Justice, I believe. And yeah, he was no longer in power. But there was another deputy at the time and he had been dismissed by this sheriff and then he was kind of reinstated by this sheriff. And when he was reinstated, he was blocked from working on this case or having any involvement in this case, which was really, really strange. You would think if something so brutal had happened in such a small community, you would want all hands on deck. You would want everybody working on this case that has the capacity to do so. But no, he had blocked this deputy. And this particular deputy has kind of theorized that, you know, he was new, he wanted to really make his mark and make a name for himself and he wanted to be the big cheese that solved this case and got to the bottom of it all and he maybe was letting his pride, his ego get in the way and he was turning away help from other people because he really wanted to nail the perpetrator and take all the credit. And I mean, it is, it's a theory, but I also think that there was so many instances and allegations of evidence tampering, suppression, just flat out ignoring some blatant red flags and circumstantial pieces of evidence. So yeah, I don't know if I would be as kind as that deputy. 
And look, years start to roll by. Tina is still, she's out there, she's missing, vanished without a trace. And although there's some nastier people in the local community who are pretty much saying, well, Sue brought trouble to her door. This is all Sue. You know, this was kind of bound to happen. There was a really big elephant in the room. And that is that a couple of weeks before all of this happened, Tina had been brought down to the sheriff's department and Tina had made a report that she had been molested by an adult in the local area. And it was an adult that was known to her. It was an adult that had access to her. And she very bravely spoke up and her mother brought her down and a formal report was made. And a lot of the names in these reports have been redacted. But suffice to say, it's very coincidental that very shortly after this report was made, this horrific murder took place. And Tina was abducted and vanished into thin air. And interestingly, that sheriff, that grossly incompetent sheriff that I had talked about earlier, at one point he was suspicious, you know, of Tina. He was wondering, maybe Tina had something to do with this because the wire that had been used to bind the boys in that cabin, that was from Tina's bedroom. And also that little shoebox that she used to have her possessions in that she carried around with her and that she would never leave home without, that was missing too and never recovered. So he didn't really elaborate more into that theory and I'm very glad that he stopped himself because the notion that Tina could possibly be responsible for any of this is beyond outrageous and bonkers. But anyway... That half cock theory got shot to shit because around the three year anniversary of this massacre, a guy was out walking in a woods a fair bit away from the Keddy cabins, but he came across the partial remains of what looked to be a small child or a young adult. And this obviously went out to the news. It was completely skeletalized, so they were going to have to bring it in for further testing. But around the time that it was broadcast on the local news, an anonymous call came through and said, oh, that's Tina Sharp, which I mean, I think anyone with a bit of common sense could probably gauge that the person that made this call either had something to do with this or had knowledge of where Tina Sharp was kind of dumped, for lack of a better word. So, yeah, they obviously had this call, anonymous or not, they had this call on tape. But it didn't really go anywhere. It kind of just went to the bottom of a box of evidence. And are we surprised? Is there any more we would expect? Probably not. And right up until like, I think it was 2016 was the last time they uncovered new evidence. So they had found a hammer in a pond nearby, which matched the description of a hammer that Martin Smart just coincidentally had noticed was missing from his home around the time of these murders. And they had also, you know, managed to, with new technology, get some DNA evidence from a piece of the tape that had been taken from the crime scene. But have any arrests been made? Have it, has anybody been charged? Nope, not a single goddamn soul. Even though you know, somewhere between 2016 and 2018, they were still apparently looking into this case and they had six people of interest apart from Martin Smart and Bo, who are both now at this point at the time of recording, they're both deceased. They're both gone. So if they had any involvement in these murders, which I kind of suspect that they had involvement in, they'll never see justice. Justice will never be served. But there is apparently six other people that they are linking to this in some way, shape or form. But no, nobody has been charged. Now, recovering Tina's body obviously is one win. I don't even know if you can call it a win. It brings some level of closure to Sheila and Greg and Rick, the three surviving siblings, and they were able to lay their sister to rest, which is finally a little monochrome of dignity for her. But do I honestly believe that we're ever going to see anybody held accountable for these? Probably not. There was so much evidence that was just either destroyed or mislaid, like from, oh, there was a leak near that box of evidence. Or they actually appointed, do you remember the deputy that had um, been blocked from the case? Well, he was later appointed 
in the last kind of 10 years or so, I believe, he was appointed as a special investigator. And he even said, you know, when I started going through the boxes of evidence, there was just shit in there that was never really analysed, that was never, you know, taken seriously. They never acted on this evidence. So whether or not they have these six people of interest and they have DNA that they've recovered, whether or not they're ever going to be able to build a case, let alone a successful case, I'm not going to hold my breath. And there are most definitely people in that community, some of them still living there today, that have information on what happened. There's suspicions that there were other people involved, whether it was before, after, or in fact, during. And maybe someday their conscience will get the better of them and they will speak up. But even if that does happen, I'm still not confident anybody will ever be held accountable. And finally, like I said in the beginning, there is a plethora of conspiracy theories and hypotheses from different groups who, you know, they think this person did it or that person did it or this person was involved. And even down to Justin, Martin Smart's stepson who was in the house that night, he's had some mud slung his way, which I like, I just, I cannot co-sign. He was a child and he, there was a whole thing with him getting hypnotized. I let you guys go and have a look at that whole spiel yourselves if a child was in the house and whether he saw something or heard something or was in fact asleep it doesn't surprise me if he had different accounts over the years because it seems like a very traumatizing thing to be a witness to at a young age so yeah no I'm not even I'm not even gonna get into any of those theories but like I said there are so many different people out there who have followed this case, who have kept up to date with any kind of new information, any updates, and they've researched it extensively and put forward just the various different theories. So if you have found yourself interested by this case, I do implore you, like I say, go ahead and look it up, do a bit of research on it yourself. There is so much more to this case and the information I've talked about in this video. We're just going over the highlights. We're basically doing a high level summary. So guys, that's it for the Keddie Cabin murders, the Sharp family murders. And thank you so much for joining me. I'll probably be back on again pretty late tonight because we've got our second case of our weekend double bill to talk about and I'm going to try and psych myself up to it. I'm going to go lock my doors, put the porch light on, put all the lights in the house on in fact because our next case is one that I won't lie freaked me out to my very core when I first heard about it. So until then guys have a lovely evening and take care.